From Microb TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 63, recorded on April 24th, 2025. I'm Vincent Bracken Yellow, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we will discuss Paul's column, Giving Infectious Diseases a Break, which probably a five year old would say it's not a good idea, but that was issued by RFK Jr. So what exactly does he mean, Paul? He is of the belief that, that we have merely traded infectious diseases for chronic diseases. And, that, that, and, and in addition, that vaccines were in many ways a, a part of that trade. In other words, that, that the, the vaccines also themselves could cause chronic diseases. So, so he's, he's done with that. Let's just ignore infectious diseases. Let's give them a break. And let's just focus on chronic diseases like diabetes or obesity. Although interestingly, NIH just recently cut a lot of money for diabetes. So that doesn't seem to be happening either. But he believes that um, that we're going to give infectious disease a break in large part because he doesn't believe in the germ theory. As he says in his book, The Real Anthony Fauci, he believes in the miasma theory, not the germ theory. So if you don't believe in the germ theory, then you can give infectious disease a break. Although I think as we'll learn today, they're not going to be giving us a break. The vast majority of people in the world, scientists or not, believe infectious agents cause disease. And the one person, maybe there's some others out there, is heading the HHS. How crazy is that? Yeah, you would think about it would sort of be a minimal criteria for heading health and human services, which is to believe that specific germs cause specific diseases and that the treatment or prevention of those germs can be life-saving, but apparently he doesn't. And, you know, Congress, the Senate who voted to confirm him, you know, they said, oh, we like this idea of dealing with chronic diseases. It's not like we haven't worked on them for years. People have been studying diabetes and every heart disease and all of that for years. Um, so I don't understand that. Why do they like that he wants to give infectious diseases a break? It makes zero, especially, say, Dr. Um, Cassidy, the physician, should know better, No. In a better world, yes, I completely agree. I don't think we're living in that world. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Um, now, it seems to me that, well, first of all, many viruses cause chronic diseases, right? <laughs> Hepatitis B virus causes cirrhosis and liver cancer. Human papillomavirus causes uh, cervical cancer as well as head, neck, anal, and genital cancers, all of which are chronic. Sure. We, we can prevent chronic diseases with vaccines. And HIV AIDS, of course, is a chronic disease. So it seems, uh, it seems uneducated to say we're going to shift our attention because you really can't if you're, if you're really and truly interested in chronic diseases. I think you are right. It's more a reflection of his not believing that viruses cause disease. As, as he said, he doesn't think HIV is the cause of AIDS. And he pretty much is ignoring the current measles epidemic. And he's trying to say it's something else in some ways. I mean, I mean there's, 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 to say that HIV doesn't cause AIDS, oh my God, we're back to the Peter Duesberg era again in the AIDS denialists. It's right. quite clear. And so he's a fringe person in terms of understanding infectious diseases, which is more the reason that flabbergasted, I'm flabbergasted that he's head of HHS. But anyway... So he wants to give infectious diseases a break. That means cut back on research, right? And surveillance and identification. And and so I think we are all about to suffer this. We're just going to turn a blind eye. We're just going to turn our back and let it all happen. And with uh, this kind of see no evil approach. So let's say that sometime in the future, a H5N1 pandemic emerges. We're not going to do any surveillance. We're not going to have a vaccine, nothing. Right. I mean, so this is what you worry about with, with bird flu, which is that it, the that H5 protein will adapt to be able to bind to the alpha-2,6 sialic acid receptor in the upper respiratory tract, so then it can reproduce in the upper respiratory tract, so it can be spread person to person and in people and therefore become a human pandemic. What, what's And it may never happen. 
But what I worry about is that we're not going to know when it happens because it certainly could happen. And what he did uh, recently was he fired the sort of top veterinarians at the FDA's sort of veterinary uh, medical center. So that in, in combination with lack of surveillance makes me worried that we're not going to know. Also, when we do things like uh, leave the Global Alliance Vaccine Initiative, leave USAID, you know, leave PEPFAR, uh, distance ourselves from the World Health Organization. We are not a favored nation in terms of um, letting us see what's going on in the world. And because bird flu could arise anywhere. Right now, it's in basically two dozen countries. Um, over the last 20 years, it's caused about a thousand cases, over 460 deaths in two dozen countries. So in any of those countries, this could mutate to become a human pandemic, but we've distanced ourselves from other countries. So as you write in the column, he's instituted massive layoffs at NIH, FDA, CDC. Is he going to replace all of them with people who study chronic diseases? Where's he going to get them? I don't know. It's, it's, it's a mess. I don't know if he knows. I, and also, I, I wish he just wouldn't use the term chronic diseases. What specific chronic disease is he talking about and what is his plan? What's his, what's his plan moving forward? It's just kind of this bald flag waving of what he's going to do. It all sounds good. You know, the we spend a lot on health care. Do we really get our bang for our buck? There's certainly a lot of people are dissatisfied reasonably with the health care system. All true. What's his plan to make things better? Because I'm telling you this, taking like red food dye number 40 out of red M&Ms is not going to make us healthier. <laughs> Paul, I hate to tell you, but he doesn't really have a plan. He does not have a plan. He has no idea what he's going to do because he's not a scientist and he doesn't know uh, how to plan science. And just this idea that he's going to solve autism by September is an example of that just incompetence, right? doesn't right. work that way. So let, let's go through some of these infectious diseases as you have in the column and, and ask the question, will they give us a break? So let's start with measles. Is measles going to give us a break. So if you look on the CDC's website this morning on mm. April 24th, um, it'll say that there are 800 confirmed cases of measles, but confirmed generally means confirmed by testing, serology or PCR. Most people, especially in these sequestered communities, don't necessarily go to the doctor. And you've had now a number of public health officials who've come forward and said, this is much worse than that. It's probably at least 3,000 cases and maybe 5,000 cases. It's already involved 25 states. Nine states have had outbreaks, meaning three or more cases. And there's been three deaths of measles, which equals the total number of deaths from measles over the last 25 years combined. We've had our first death in a child since 2003. And this virus is raging, and it is the most contagious of the vaccine-preventable diseases. That in combination with the fact that immunization rates are declining, um, parents are more parents are choosing not to vaccinate their children. And I think most importantly, people don't remember measles. I think it's not just that we've eliminated measles, which we did by the year 2000. We've eliminated the memory of measles. People don't remember how sick this virus can make you. You know, we recently had a child in our hospital with measles, and most of the doctors in our hospital had never seen a case of measles before. And as you point out, he's, he's ignored the seriousness of, of the disease and has failed to promote vaccination. Yes, which is what he should do. He's held press conferences about autism. He's held press conferences about food dyes. What he should do is hold a press conference every other day about this measles epidemic and what we're doing about it and encourage vaccination, especially in areas where there's low vaccination rates. The opposite is happening. He doesn't say that. He gets in front of the public and says measles vaccine uh, kills people every year. Measles vaccine causes blindness and deafness. Measles vaccine causes the same symptoms of, of measles. There are adverse events from the vaccine. It does cause deaths every year. It causes it causes all the illnesses that measles itself cause encephalitis and blindness, etc. So he misinforms the public. And although he will occasionally say the measles vaccine is the best way to prevent measles, first of all, it's the only way to prevent measles. And when he says it, honestly, he looks like he's under duress because it's <laughs> not easy for him to say that because he still thinks the measles, mumps, and ball vaccine causes autism. He also pointed out that because of his funding cuts, they haven't been able to do measles vaccination clinics in Dallas, for example. That's right. There were like, I think, more than a dozen, almost two dozen clinics that were set to open up in areas in schools where immunization rates were low and they don't have the money 
So we, we don't have the money to, to give the vaccines. We don't have the, the money to really do the kind of surveillance to let us know who's at risk. And and I just think this virus will rage. I mean, hopefully measles tech, technically usually sort of settles out by by mid-May. That's what happened during the Philadelphia measles epidemic in 1991. By mid-May, things settled down. I hope that's true now, but maybe not. Maybe it'll continue to rage throughout the year. We'll see. Paul, if it stops, he's going to claim that vitamin A stopped it. Right. This is the, I mean, I don't want it to continue because it causes suffering, but, uh, well, you know, that's going to feed into his narrative. Okay. What about uh, whooping cough? We haven't, we're seeing a surge in whooping cough, right? Will it give us a break? We're not talking about that. So last year, 2024, we had roughly 35,000 cases of pertussis or whooping cough and about a dozen deaths. That was more than anything we'd seen in eight years. This year, we've already early have had more than 6,600 cases and, and deaths in a handful of states that had not seen pertussis deaths in years, including Louisiana had two deaths. And um, I just don't... Uh, uh, think that people understand how serious this disease can be. This 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 fire this bacteria kills babies, especially young babies, because they have a, a narrow windpipe. And um, this mm -hmm. is again a preventable preventable illness, and it's surging. Pertussis is surging, and flu surged last year. I mean, we had eight hundred thousand hospitalizations, tens of thousands of deaths from from flu last year, uh, because less than half of our country gets a flu vaccine. So the the pertussis is vaccine preventable, right? Yeah, we have we've had a so, since the 1940s. Is are a lot of these cases in children who have not been vaccinated due to the parents not wanting to do that? Yeah, especially young children, especially say the less than three month old. That that's the group most likely to die, which is why it's important for women during pregnancy to vax to receive the uh, pertussis vaccine. So his giving infectious diseases a break doesn't just involve measles; it's going to involve many other things. Um, what about coronaviruses? Are they going to give us a break? Well, so we've had three coronavirus pandemics in the last 20 years, right? We had SARS-1 in 2002, 2003. We had MERS in 2012. Now we've had SARS-CoV-2 in 2019 up till now. And will there be another coronavirus pandemic? Of course there will. I mean, usually the, the, the bats are the origin. Um, bats are a large part of the mammalian population with deforestation. If anything, we're living closer to bats. And you know, there was a study done um, in rural China trying to answer the question, if you live in rural China where you're fairly close to bats, what percentage of people have been infected with bat coronaviruses? And the answer was about one in 40. This is not rare. These spillover events are not rare at all. Yeah. Well, uh, we will see if there is a pandemic of flu or a coronavirus in the near future. We will see RFK and Jay Bhattacharya stand up and say, we're not making a vaccine. We're going to let it rip. Just let it kill. Yeah, for and keep the, everything open because we want the economy. Well, there is no economy left now. It's all been trashed, so I'm not sure how much of an argument that is. You also write about MPOX. What, how does that play into giving infectious diseases a break? Well, so there's a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine just in the last month or so uh, showing that there is in Africa now a dramatic increase over the last two years in the number of cases of MPOX, about 45,000 cases, about 1,500 deaths. And that was the source of the virus, which first came into this country around 2022. That's when we had our first death. And we had about 29,000 cases of MPOX. Um, we have a vaccine for that, the Genios vaccine. Um, but again, it's raging in, in, again in Africa, so much so that they have declared again a public health emergency and international travel is common. And so again, he may be trying to give infectious diseases a break, but they're not going to be giving us a break. <laughs> is it, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but you, you know, all these U.S. aid funds that were cut, is it possible that some of them went towards helping nations uh, vaccinate or prevent MPOX? Sure. I mean, so, so you have a vaccine to prevent that. And I just, what I worry is that we're making ourselves a pariah among other nations. And so where they may normally be more willing to let us in to see what's going on, especially for things like bird flu or MPOX, that, that they'll be less interested in doing that. I mean, I think that with this, with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, China was culpable here. They didn't let 
uh, other scientists from other countries come in very early to, to look at what was going on. And I think yeah. that in many ways contributed to a lot of the conspiracies that are surrounding COVID now. So uh, the, one virus not on your list, uh, there are many viruses you could put on, uh, is polio virus. And I think that um, if polio vaccination rates drop, we will see outbreaks of polio again because the virus is circulating in wastewater in the U.S. So that means people are infected. They don't. We don't see poliomyelitis because everyone's vaccinated or many people are vaccinated. But uh, if he has an impact on polio vaccine, he already said that polio has killed more people than it's it's prevented polio, right? <laughs> he, he has said, he, RFK Jr., has said that the polio vaccine killed, and this is his quote, many, many, many more people than it saved. Kill many, 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 many more people than polio ever did. So that's wrong. I, I think that polio, you know this better than me, is a very emotional disease. And that case in 2022 in Rockland County did get a lot of attention. I mean, this is a person who never left this country, who was infected with one of these revertent um, mm -hmm. vac vaccine strains that are derived from the, the oral polio vaccine. And although we don't use that vaccine in this country anymore, it's still used in the world and international travel is common. And when you see it in wastewater, knowing that only roughly one in 200 people or so who are infected with polio are paralyzed by it, you know that that man in Rockland County was the tip of a bigger iceberg. I think were there to be other cases of polio, I think that would, would change things because polio scares people. I mean, polio was a feared, feared disease, much more so than, say, measles or pertussis. So do you think there will be a point if we have raging measles and influenza, coronaviruses, polio, will people realize that this is enough, it shouldn't be this way, it can be prevented, uh, and say, get rid of him? I think... I think that, so the two deaths in children, a healthy six-year-old, a healthy eight-year-old, both of whom were well-nourished and healthy, had no risk factors, were in a Mennonite community. And I think people look at that and they think, well, that's them. That's mm. not us. That's not us. And I, so I think where it may spill over, where it will have much more impact is the healthy 11-month-old waiting in the doctor's office for the vaccine. Two parents who, who are, believe in vaccines, who want to get their child vaccinated, but then inadvertently contract measles while waiting in the waiting room, who then get measles and die from measles. I think that that kind of story will get out there. And because the parents now of the of these two children who died in the Mennonite community have been, in many ways, kind of corrupted by anti-vaccine activists who spent a lot of time with them and told them basically that they did the right thing. And um, so I think that, that once it spills over more into mainstream communities, I think this will have impact. I think it will. I, I just think the uh, anti-vaccine people are winning in the sense that they've convinced enough people now not to be vaccinated that, uh, that children are suffering mightily. There is no world in which what RFK Jr. is doing, his malignant incompetence, is acceptable. A government's job is to protect its citizens in many ways, including their health. And this one is failing to do so. It's, it, it blows me away, Paul. It's unimaginable in many ways. All right, we'll put a link to the column in the show notes so you can read it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.